Welcome back everyone to the Easy Med channel where medical topics are made easy. Today you're going to learn how to best approach the patient with upper abdominal pain. As always on Easy Med, you're going to be provided with a simple trick or strategy to remember the material. And today you're going to be provided with an easy mnemonic that's going to help you remember the different emergent causes to upper abdominal pain. Let's start this off by taking a look at how many things can cause upper abdominal pain. To complicate matters, some of these causes are emergent while others are less urgent and can be managed outpatient. It's your job to be able to distinguish does the patient have an emergent cause or a less urgent cause to their symptoms. For example, a patient with upper abdominal pain could be presenting with a heart attack or they could be presenting with a simple ulcer that could be managed outpatient. This video is going to help provide you with the necessary tools to best approach the patient with upper abdominal pain so you don't miss anything bad. So the first thing to do with any patient that initially presents to you is a primary survey. This will include assessing the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. And if any of those need to be optimized, you're going to want to address that sooner than later. Take a look at the patient as a whole. Do they look sick or not sick? You might also want to obtain an EKG, especially if you're worried about a cardiac cause leading to their upper abdominal pain. As all of this is going on, you're also going to want to obtain the patient's vital signs. This will include blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. You might also want to get a point of care glucose. Things like DK can cause upper abdominal pain as well. Lastly, the patient will need to be hooked up to cardiac monitor, pulse oximetry, and an IV should be established. If the patient is stable and time allows, you can do a chart review. And this will include things like looking at the patient's age, their gender, what are their vital signs, what medications do they take, review their past medical, surgical, family, and social history, see if they have any previous visits for similar complaints, and if they do, what were they diagnosed with, and what was done at that time. You can also review any previous imaging, especially those that pertain to the abdomen. This could include things like CT abdomen and pelvis, x-ray of the abdomen, or any ultrasounds of the abdomen. Don't forget to also review previous EKGs. This chart review is going to allow you to better understand the patient, and it might tailor your conversation into what questions you're going to ask them when you're getting a history. I will warn you, though, don't let the chart review form premature bias, as this could lead to error and you might miss something bad. And unfortunately, as we saw before, that list of potential causes to upper abdominal pain is long. So I've got an easy mnemonic to help you remember the main emergent causes to upper abdominal pain. And this mnemonic, fittingly, is upper stomach. The U is going to help you remember urinary causes. And this includes things like kidney stone and infections such as urinary tract infection and pyelonephritis. P is going to help you remember pancreatic causes. This will include pancreatitis or any type of pancreatic mass. The second P is going to help you remember pulmonary causes. Remember, things in the thorax can cause upper abdominal pain as well. So this will include things like pneumonia or pulmonary embolism. E stands for ectopic, and this is going to help you remember to get that pregnancy test if appropriate. R stands for really early appendicitis. Most of the time, appendicitis will present with right lower quadrant abdominal pain. But in the early presentation, it could be generalized abdominal pain or even upper abdominal pain. S stands for stomach, and the main emergent cause to upper abdominal pain that's related to the stomach is gastric perforation. T stands for twisting, and this will help you remember things like bulbulus as well as ischemic bowel. O stands for obstruction, and this could include bowel obstruction or foreign body ingestion that's leading to obstruction. M stands for MI. This will help you remember that there are cardiac causes that can lead to upper abdominal pain as well. This could include things like acute coronary syndrome, but M also stands for myocarditis. This will help you remember the realm of myocarditis and pericarditis that could lead to upper abdominal pain as well. So the point is, don't forget about the heart. There are cardiac causes that can lead to abdominal pain as well. A is going to help you remember aorta, and this will include things like AAA and aortic dissection. C stands for cholecystitis and cholangitis. This will help you remember biliary and gallbladder causes to upper abdominal pain. And lastly, H stands for hepatitis, and this will help you remember hepatic causes to upper abdominal pain. So hopefully this mnemonic will help you remember the main emergent causes to upper abdominal pain. It's not to say that other causes can't become emergent or that there aren't other emergent causes, but these are the main ones. And with that list of potential diagnoses that can lead to upper abdominal pain being so long, this will help organize it by organ or by system so that way you're less likely to miss something bad. So now that you've done that primary survey on the patient, possibly performed that chart review if time allowed and the patient was stable, and you're starting to think about the upper stomach mnemonic as the causes to upper abdominal pain, it's time to obtain that history from the patient. You're going to use that history to refine and prioritize that differential. Remember we said a lot of things can cause upper abdominal pain. So you're going to use that history to prioritize the more likely versus the less likely, and it's also going to help you figure out how you're going to work up the patient. 
So when you obtain that history, I think it's always good to let the patient talk to you first. Don't ask too many questions, don't interrupt them, let them share their thoughts and feelings as to what's going on. Then afterwards, if you have more questions, feel free to ask them. But by the end of the conversation, you should have a good idea of the nature and onset of their pain. Where's their pain located and does it radiate? What were they doing when their symptoms started? How bad is their pain one to 10? What does it feel like? Have they done anything for their symptoms? Does anything make it better or worse? Do they have any other associated symptoms? So you get the point and there's other questions you can ask too, but by the end of the conversation, you really wanna have a good understanding of the nature of their pain. You'll also wanna perform a review of systems and some considerations on how to do that include using the upper stomach mnemonic, or you can go by organ system, starting with intra-abdominal sources and then moving to extra-abdominal sources. Once you've obtained that history, you'll wanna perform a thorough physical examination. Some considerations include palpating all the quadrants of the abdomen, checking for things like guarding, rebound, tenderness, or masses. Don't forget to check the overlying skin as well. You'll wanna check for signs of trauma, bruising, rashes. Maybe they have early shingles or herpes zoster that's leading to their abdominal pain. You could also auscultate the abdomen and listen for bowel sounds. Don't forget the thorax either. Listen to the heart and lungs. Remember that there are thoracic causes that can lead to upper abdominal pain. You can also check for CVA tenderness, and if you're worried about a GI bleed, you might need to do a guaiac test if you feel that's necessary. So now that you have obtained that history and performed the physical examination, you should have a pretty good prioritized differential list that's gonna help you figure out how you're gonna work up this patient. Some lab considerations include the following. For most patients with abdominal pain, standard basic labs will include CBC, chemistry, liver function tests, and lipase, which checks the pancreas. If you're worried about a urinary source or need to check the urine for any reason, then get a urinalysis. If the patient is higher risk or you're worried about surgical or ischemic causes or sepsis or any other reason to get a lactate, then do so. Don't forget about a pregnancy test if appropriate. And if there's any concern for an infectious etiology, then you should consider blood cultures and or urine cultures. If the patient is higher risk for a cardiac cause leading to their upper abdominal pain, then make sure to obtain that EKG. Lastly, the patient may require imaging. This could include a CT abdomen and pelvis, or maybe you're concerned about hepatobiliary disease and a right upper quadrant ultrasound could help you with that. You could get an aortic ultrasound to assess for AAA. Maybe you're worried about a peritoneal abdomen from a perforated ulcer and getting an upright chest and abdomen x-ray could show you free air. Abdominal x-rays could also be used to look for obstructive pathology or other reasons. Maybe you're worried about an intrathoracic cause to their upper abdominal pain and a chest x-ray could help you with that. Or maybe you need to go more advanced and get a CT chest. Lastly, if there's any concern for a renal cause to their abdominal pain, you could consider a renal ultrasound. Let's wrap this up by talking about different presentations that medical exams and board exams like to use to describe upper abdominal pain. It's not to say that all patients present this way, but this is how they show up in question stems on tests. So if a patient presents with epigastric pain that's worse after meals and they describe it as burning, what do you wanna consider? Think about things like peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, or GERD, if a patient presents with right upper quadrant abdominal pain that's worse after meals, you'll want to consider things like biliary colic. If the question stem asks you about fever, right upper quadrant pain, vomiting, a positive Murphy sign, then they're asking you about cholecystitis. If the patient presents with fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice, remember that this is Charcot's triad, and this will help you remember that it's cholangitis. If the patient has fever, right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, which is that triad we just talked about, plus ultramental status and hypotension, well, this is Reynolds Pentad, and this too describes cholangitis. If the patient complains of burning sharp epigastric pain that radiates to the back, maybe they had recent alcohol use or ingestion or a history of cholelithiasis, well, those are risk factors to pancreatitis, so that's what they're gonna be testing you on. If the patient has flank pain, nausea, they're writhing in pain, they have hematuria, then this one's pretty obvious, it's going to be nephrolithiasis or kidney stones. If the patient is a smoker, they're a male, and you appreciate a pulsatile mass on examination, then they're gonna be asking you about a AAA. If the question stem describes a distended abdomen, no bowel movements or flatus, a history of multiple abdominal surgeries, then they're gonna be asking you about bowel obstructions. If the patient has abdominal pain out of proportion to the examination, and maybe they have a history of AFib, and even worse, they're not anticoagulated, then consider things like mesenteric ischemia. If the question stem describes a sudden onset abdominal pain presentation and the examination is consistent with the peritoneal abdomen, then you wanna think about gastric or bowel perforation. Lastly, if the patient has exertional epigastric pain that improves with rest, then you wanna think about acute coronary syndrome. 
Hopefully the upper stomach mnemonic was useful to you. And hopefully this video provides you with an organized approach to the patient with undifferentiated upper abdominal pain. Please consider subscribing if you found the video content useful. Feel free to comment and like below as well. If you wanna perform well in class, ace your exams, and keep up with your medical knowledge clinically, I encourage you to follow EasyMed on Instagram at EasyMed Learning. Thanks for watching. Hope you check out future videos.